So stance wise, a couple of different ways I've looked at it and a couple that make sense. I always tell people to go roughly with a natural hip width stance. If they struggle to get into that because used to doing a wider stance, maybe squatting, maybe other exercises. Another thing I try which some of you guys might have seen before is jump and see where you land and see where that ends up. So I've read that a few times and it makes sense. Ends up being a bit wider than I would naturally actually deadlift, but gets you there and thereabouts. Foot position, tend to go quite straight in the deadlift, but actually having a little bit of an angle, again, helps a lot of people just keeping that tension and keeping the positioning of the knees staying out slightly as well. So then getting the hands in a comfortable position where they are not like encroaching on their legs too much. So if they've got like a normal width grip, then they're clear. And then they'll come up through the top, down through the bottom. They always be clear of the legs. So that also sets that up. So you can look at the hands. Rather than it being absolute, you just look at having where you are on the bar, just a little bit of a gap. So as you're setting, maybe we've got like, not quite thumb's distance, but you've got a bit of a gap between the outside of the hand and the outside of the leg. So From there, I guess the biggest thing that I think when, when deadlifting is to actually, at first, stop people thinking about lifting the bar and actually just creating tension against the bar. So, if we're looking at that, so go ahead, feet, set, hands just outside, and then from here, you've got your grip, and it's literally creating that tension on the bar there. So, I get a bar underneath of someone who's struggling to get position and just literally get them to pull against it. So they've got a bar up into the rails and they just pop, oh, yeah, pull yeah. it against it. So here, perhaps like someone's got an 80 kilo deadlift, got 140, 150 kilos on it, and just like, just pull, just get some position and hold. So it's like, what, you just wrap out to just show them that you can. You <laughs> 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 should do this, say, what's wrong with you? No, like actually get them to do it and try to lift it. Yeah. But, they know they're not going to lift it, so we like, do everything you've said position-wise. So try to bend the bar, drive your chest through, keep that tension in your hamstrings, keep your armpits over the bar, do all of that, and imagine you're trying to bend the bar like, as much as you can. Like, well, unless I get it massively wrong, and they suddenly do lift it, <laughs> they're not going to lift it, but they get the idea of the tension they need. Yeah, so sometimes we're even explaining and saying, look, if you need to get the tension at the beginning, feel your face land a bit red. Like feel like a bit of tension creating like everywhere in your body. Yeah, it's not just kind of like a relaxed thing, you know, like you want enough tension because you're going from a dead stop that you have to be working hard everywhere. Looking at that in terms of setting up, what I get most people to do is if they are wearing shoes, is before they've actually even got their hands in the bar. I mean, they can get their hand distance first of all, once it's standing, looking down, as you could say, for most people, somewhere near the bottom of their laces. Because then what you're giving there is enough space for most people to set up and keep their shins close to the bar without being, as you said, too far away, which is then going to create a bit of torque and pull you forward somewhat, or end up losing the position when you drag it in towards you. I would go more where the body is in relation to the bar, and I think something again that we said when we did the squat one was like all of us can pretty much see if someone does a deadlift and it looks quite good, you can squat straight away. If it looks a bit shit, you can squat straight away as well. Mm -hmm. But then there's a little nuances that you think like what is making that difference and what is actually going to help someone with that position a little bit. So you mentioned to Francis earlier when we talked about it a little bit is as you set yourself is what you look for is where you go into a neutral spine position and have the bar close, is looking at where you can set, create a bit of tension in the hamstrings, like ask them if they can feel that, and still maintain the bar underneath the armpit. So if you've got the bar in the arm of the armpit, 
then from there you can be fairly confident that a client's going to be in a good position. They may end up a bit hip high, potentially, but you could probably spot that as being a little bit close because it'll be further back than the armpit. If it's too far away, it looks obvious. And if it's too far away, that might be often where you get someone sitting down too low. You can see the armpits behind the bar there, yeah. rather than being above it. So it's just getting that feeling. And I think you said Scott actually gave you this cue yesterday yeah, in the class meeting, stay over the bar. And I think some people actually almost focus too much on sitting back that they don't stay over the bar quite enough. And I think that's like a really good one to perhaps think about is like literally, if you draw a line from your armpits straight down over the bar, that's where most people can create a decent amount of tension like through their lats and through their back. And then like leading on from now, I'd say that actually gives like a secondary cue, which is really good when you are looking to get people into good deadlift position at the bottom, is armpits again, it's like squeeze in, so to create tension in the lats and the upper back. But yeah, so actually gripping the bar hard, and all you're saying is that almost like you're externally rotating, I guess slightly, so you're like, like you're trying to bend the bar, and sort of use that almost in two ways as well, so like you're almost trying to bend the bar to get the chest open, upper back nice and nice and engaged, like strong as well, engaged up there. But also then as they're looking to break the bar off the floor, which we'll come into in a minute, is getting that movement where it is like you're trying to pull through the bar, as opposed to getting moving like, if you're looking at getting it off the ground, it would be getting it off the ground as quietly as possible. As opposed to where you might get someone like grabbing at it a little bit. So that's where like, yeah, like yeah. actually bending the bar almost is like again sort of a twofold cube you can use like both ways, but actually I guess they they are both doing the same thing and actually going towards the same end point which is creating that tension in the beginning yeah. of the lift. Yeah. I think alternating, like even if you didn't treat like your heavier sets, maybe if you're not getting to a one rep max, but like say sets of five maybe as, as like the top end and you're alternating sets between one and the other and they can cope with that, then even that works well because it's like going back to actually looking why a mixed grip works and it is like especially if you're using weight lifting bars, it's just countering the spin. So if you've got both hands in there, then your grip goes and it just spins out your hand if you've got mixed but one going one way, one going the other, and that stops it from going where it does. And that's obviously why straps work as well, because you've got straps going the opposite way to your hands, stops it from spinning, and stops it from going out of your hands. And I think for, yeah, for a client, I personally, if they've got five to 10% of their effort going on and just holding onto the bar, as opposed to holding the neutral spine or keeping the bar close, I think that's probably better spent on focusing on the bar and maybe their body position and anything else. If you've got a client and say their goal is to deadlift 100 kilos, are you trying to get them to do that with straps or without, or do you not really care? Don't yeah, mind. Do, doesn't fuss me with life. If they, were, I mean, if they said to me I want to do it without straps, That's then, what you'd... then we'd go for that. I'd say to them what I think about the positioning and what's kind of important, what exactly what I just said there, like in terms of body position and getting everything in the right place. And it's like, is that part of your goal or do you just want to deadlift 100 kilos? And then, yeah, then establish that. And then, if you're meant to using straps in order to do it, then like sort of so be it. it I think it's for me, it's like it's more like everything else, it's kind of not stigmatizing it as such. If they want to do it that way, cool. If they don't, this is what I would do, sort of thing. That's the way like, I would go about it. I, I stigmatize straps quite a bit. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't like clients use straps. Because with my own training, I thought it was the best thing I ever did was getting rid of straps. Hmm. Like it made me stronger yeah, across like the, the, the yeah, it made me stronger like, yeah. across the board. But then again, I was actively training my grip as well. So, so my mindset's always been a bit like if I've got a client and they're losing the position because their grip's holding them back, then they need a stronger grip. Yeah, I always kind of thought like like that. I mean, I guess it might be a bit of a hard line approach, and probably needless yeah, to say. Yeah, but only in the sense that, like, obviously, we want people to do better stuff in the gym in order to carry on doing better stuff in the gym, like from yeah. an absolute point of view. But if you look at like, it's the functional side of it, like how many people are gonna lift anything as heavy as what they might deadlift in the gym, like in real life. So would their grip actually be a limiting factor in that? Like if I was looking at that part of the argument, I, I would say that maybe 
isn't that much of a factor. Mm. Yeah, if, 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 if they had something group specific that they were trying to do, then maybe you're right, and actually doing group that way would help, and doing the group training 100%. Like all the different things you do, like plate holds, um, like single arm holds and bars and stuff. Loaded carries. Yeah. Yeah. But then I'd also say, if you wanted to train someone's grip because their grip was getting weaker, is a mixed grip really training their grip? Or is it just training against the movement of the bar? Yeah. It would yeah, actually just be the overhand grip that might be, if you wanted to make the overhand grip stronger, you'd get to a point where you had someone working up to a certain level and their grip's about to go, hold it at the top for as long as you can. Yeah. Just keep it there and that's probably going to be more actual specific training than that. anything else, yeah. Yeah, so I would say like I'm pretty, I get people to keep a neutral head position. I do it myself, it's like literally, I'm just looking just down, so just, just neutral neck. But at the same time, all you've got to think is that just by having your head up or head down, you're not going to create any massive tension or load through your survival spine. So it's not the end of the world. If someone's got a movement pattern where they're deadlift and they head up, but everything else is pretty sweet, so I don't think it's the end of the world. But if you're getting someone to do it from scratch, then maybe it'd be something if you wanted to get them to like, have a focal point because they're in here with no mirrors, like you said, that's a good point. Just yeah, keeping the chin down, having a ball between the, the chin and the chest a little bit could be helpful. And if it was deadlifting in terms of progressing onto Olympic lifts, I don't know quite as much about that, but I don't know if the head position is something you think about a bit more perhaps, is it something that you'd want to... I tend to go head up a little bit more. Yeah, that's what to say. Just in order so you're keeping your head up consistently all the way through. Yeah. So yeah, so again, I think that'd be, that'd be another reason why more people here might actually have a head up position when you're doing it. But again, like, either way, I don't think it's that crucial. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like if someone was doing head up or head down, Neither here nor there if their lower back is neutral, you know. It's all good. It's when someone's trying to attack it, go really hard into it, it's making that first bit too quick. If it's too quick, it might be heavy. Pitch onto your toes, bar gets away. Pitch, hips come up, bar gets away. It creates that, it makes it tougher straight away if any of those things happen. If you can lock yourself in, keep that tension, and then keep it steady, and then from here, come through as strong as you can. That would be the biggest thing that I would get most people to do. Say if they're at an intermediate level, and they're looking to get better, they're probably always looking to get it off the floor a bit too quick. So you, that has a huge crossover into the Olympic lifting side of things, because you see it all the time, even with empty barbells or whatever, just rip try and rip it. Quickly. Yeah. But more so when it gets heavy. Bar goes away. Yeah, yeah. even that control of an empty barbell, yeah. if they're trying to lift it, they haven't got to. Yeah. And it's like, just, just try, try, and, all the way through. try and describe it as like it's a smooth progression of speed on the way up. Like starting from that smooth, and then as it passes the knee, then you, like you say, then you can start to yeah. Yeah, yeah. whack on some power into it. But you see hips raise, chest fall forward, bars come out in front all the time. You definitely get people as well when they when they practice it like that with empty bars. When you get a bit of weight on it, it's not going to go fast, and then they panic and they're not patient yeah. with it. They yeah. kind of expect it to fly off. So that's then the name. That's why when they go to, to mid shin and they're like, oh shit, this is not going fast. What's going on? Bang! And they they yeah. they freak them out. That's it. So exactly. Rather than being really tough off the ground and then being slow, slow, and then getting a bit quicker, it's like comes off the ground. It's like shit. What do I do now? Because it's kind yeah. of stopped. I think that, that cue we were saying earlier about staying over the bar. Yeah, 100%. And not panicking and trying to get your chest up too high too early and just stay, fight out, and then go follow the same pattern as you would do yeah. normally. I would say for most people, first and foremost, it's like, because get on the side, we talk about diaphragmatic breathing and actually like working on that side, but that takes a little bit of time of work in itself. So, I'll get most people just to hold their breath at the bottom, get it through to the knee level probably, and then once they're coming up the flyers, going through to lock out, just exhale, mm -hmm. breathe and exhale at the top. But keeping some tension at the bottom of the lift would be the most important thing. Like we've been talking about all along, I guess. So it's actually like 
getting that deep breath in, then holding it. So if we're like looking at diaphragmatic pressure, like literally, and then like your belly pushes out, if you've got a belt, you obviously use that as a teaching tool of how to push out. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to actually get people doing it. But a deep breath, regardless of how someone takes it, is going to create some tension. So I always think that that's more positive than just being floppy and not knowing when to breathe at all. Because it kind of sets up the order of the breathing, even if they can't quite do the diaphragmatic breathing straight away, which a lot of people can't, I guess. Even in my own PT, I teach it from top down. Yeah. So you just look at that initial start position, which is obviously here, finish position. But start position would be top, so actually looking at making sure this stays up, shoulders stay engaged, and that little bit of tight brace position. Yeah. And then breaking from there, so that fingers crossed when they get to there, they're loading weight, they've already learned that. So actually, then just for me, to start at the top. So yeah, so if I was going from the top, and getting to the top, or whichever way it was, and someone was like showing like hyperextension straight away. I'd actually first of all get them to, to think about the hips a little bit more, and then what they do when they come through from there. So it's, it's, I guess it's, it's the same end. It's a slightly different way of getting there. So they're coming up from through here. They feel like they're sort of end, almost always in a little bit soft legs, and then they push back into it from there. So I say think about locking out your thighs, and then just like squeeze through the hips. It's almost like just tilt forward a little bit at the hips. So rather than thinking about the upper body as much, you're actually just thinking about the finish position through from the lower body. I actually feel like your cues really good. I think I noticed you doing it with somebody last week in the evening, and actually I don't even think about it because that's actually like really sound. But it works a lot better if you're actually going from the top down because you get it set up initially before yeah. you actually go. Whereas like if you're finishing the deadlift, I guess the reason why I go with what I've done is actually thinking about how you want to finish a deadlift, and that would be thinking about the legs and the hips. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, top down, I actually would probably, I'd probably use that now because that's, that's actually like really good, like, I really like that. In terms of just like thinking about a set position, get your chest up, but stay yeah. just slightly locked down. But yeah, I, I think again for most people, unless you're doing a circuit, and even then sometimes, because of like the energy expansion involved in terms of putting yourself into a position where you're gaining tension. I think it's worthwhile doing it for most people right from the beginning until they've got that consistency of movement because also you'll find people when they're putting the bar down will lose where the bar goes and lose position on that as well. So that can end up being like a little bit of a, of a problem whereas putting the bar down solidly, resetting again, ends up much more consistent just in terms of like the, the movement overall. So. If we're looking for a cue for that, what I'd get people doing, like I said, we'll go back onto regressions in a minute. So they lift and then come down. It's thinking, remain in deadlift, pass your knees, then straight down. So you go down, remain in deadlift, straight down. So it's like almost once you pass your knees, squat. And then that way you're in position. And then you can have like, like I said, either a quick reset, get tension again, or even if they're just on the floor there, just tighten a little bit and back into it. But it's just like consistency of that movement. I think if there's just that moment to get tension at the bottom, that's always going to be helpful from the beginning. Did you teach it that way straight away? In terms of? Like, so, like, you know, like you say, like, coming past the knees and then almost dropping down. When you're Maybe not as fast as I was doing it. Maybe like a little bit slower. So it would still be the same movement going past, once we're past the knee, but maybe just a bit slower getting to the floor and still getting that little bit of tension again before the lift, but yeah, maybe not as fast as I was doing it there, because that's kind of like, yeah, I guess practice and actually being able to hit that same point when it gets to the floor every time. I'd never disagree with like maintaining tension for as long for a movement as possible. Like the, the, the pull up and chin up analogy there is 100% like for everyone, it's like, don't drop to the bottom because you're fucking losing tension and you're losing some stretch reflex from your next one anyway, it's pointless, which is the only reason why on this I would say it's maybe not as crucial is because if you are doing it as a, as a deadlift, you're going to be getting down to the floor and then hopefully create the tension again if we're doing it that way. So, yeah, I mean, I would, if you're doing it that way, I would carry on because it's, it's not, you're not going to lose anything by doing that. But if you've got someone who, for the last two inches of the lift, 
relaxes on the way down, the risk is very low. And if they create intention for each next rep, like a, I guess a true deadlift as such, then I don't think there's a problem there so much. You know? Yeah, I guess, I guess in, my, in my head, because it's more of a crossfit background, I guess. And you've got the touch and go. Because you have the constant the touch and goes and, and yeah. stuff. So keeping that, that tension at the exactly bottom has always been there. Yeah. But yeah, I guess if I had someone that was doing like twos or threes or singles, then yeah. that tension like, is not like, massively if a problem. If you analogised again, if you said someone squatting was like... Just dropping, yeah. Yeah. And then like coming back up from there, like, fuck yourself up. Like, yeah. they were sort of like a deadlift, it gets to the floor, you can tense, like get tense again and come up. And so it's not so much of an issue with that. 